Gadolinium-based contrast agents used in MRI scans are certainly helpful for diagnosis. This is someone with a left frontal lobe meningioma, a benign brain tumor which avidly takes up the dye. This is a child with a fourth ventricle ependymoma, a different type of brain tumor, which is virtually invisible without contrast dye. This is a 25-year-old woman with multiple sclerosis having a relapse with imbalance and muscle spasticity. The breakdown of the blood-brain barrier causes the gadolinium to extravasate into the lesions, helping to guide diagnosis and treatment. It's also good for meningeal diseases. This is someone with headache due to cerebrospinal fluid leak. You could see the diffuse pachymeningeal enhancement. The study would be normal, most likely, without gadolinium. But are are these agents safe? Do they carry significant risks? Well, I'll give it a little background. Gadolinium itself is a rare earth element, one of the lanthanides on your periodic table. It's a silvery gray metal and looks like this. And on its own, as an element, it's very toxic to humans. Hence, it's given in gadolinium-based contrast agents with a chelator, another molecule which binds gadolinium, preventing its release as a free atom. To give an analogy, the amalgams in your dental work contain mercury, which is very toxic, but the mercury is bound to other metals, limiting its release into the bloodstream, reducing the toxicity. It's not used in all MRI scans, but gadolinium-based contrast agents, and there are several of them, and I'll show you them later. They're used in around 30 to 40 percent of MRI scans, and hundreds of millions of doses of these contrast agents have been given. They're useful because they appear very bright on T1 sequences, they enhance the image as I showed you earlier. Gadolinium-based contrast agents are rapidly eliminated by the kidneys with a half-life of only around two hours. However, very small amounts are retained within the organs of the body up to eight years later. So small amounts do stay in the body, and certain contrast agents actually have some liver and biliary tree elimination, but they're, for the most part, eliminated by the kidneys. By the way, I'm a neurologist, not a radiologist, certainly not an MRI safety expert, so take this as general information, not medical advice. I'll include some citations in the notes below. Now, it's not exactly known why gadolinium is toxic. One theory is it has a similar size, shape, and charge to calcium and may compete with calcium within reactions within the cell. Also, it may induce an inflammatory response. Some of the common side effects include pain, and joint stiffness, nausea. You can be allergic to gadolinium or even have anaphylaxis in rare cases. Now, for people with significant kidney disease who cannot eliminate gadolinium, it can cause a rare disease called nephrogenic systemic fibrosis, where gadolinium deposits throughout the body and causes discoloration and tension within the skin and damages the organs. It can be very serious, but this is extremely rare because gadolinium-based contrast agents are generally a avoided in people with significant kidney impairment. However, some amount of gadolinium is retained in various organs in the body, especially the bone, but also the liver, the skin, the spleen, the kidneys, and even the brain. It seems that it preferentially goes to the bone and skin, and the bone may act as a reservoir of gadolinium, but it can get into the brain as well. In one animal studies, a week after gadolinium administration, a small amount, 0.00019% of the original dose was detected in the brain. And after 20 weeks, this reduced by 50%, but it can persist for a very long time, up to eight years in some studies. And there's an idea that this retained gadolinium could cause symptoms, which has been called gadolinium deposition disease. We do know that these contrast agents can be toxic because there are rare cases of coma or even death with very high doses, especially when it's given intrathecally, in other words, directly into the cerebrospinal fluid. Let's look at some
some images of retained gadolinium. This is an MRI of the brain. We're looking at axial slices like this through the brain stem. This is a scan without contrast given. This is the pons, this is the cerebellum, these are the temporal lobes. And you can see there's a lot of gadolinium contrast in the dentate nucleus, which has been retained from a prior administration of a gadolinium-based contrast agent. These are scans from a 61-year-old man with a brain tumor, a left frontal glioblastoma, who had 35 MRI scans with contrast dye to monitor the tumor. These images are unenhanced images without contrast dye. On the left is the baseline image, and on the right, after 35 administrations of gadolinium, you can see retained gadolinium within the superior colliculi, the reg nucleus, and substantia nigra, and and superior cerebellar peduncle, scary images, but perhaps it was necessary to monitor the tumor. Here's a 42-year-old woman with a right frontal glioblastoma who had 55 MRI scans and 55 administrations of gadolinium. In the left upper corner is the baseline scan, and again, these are all unenhanced images without gadolinium. You can see the tumor in the right frontal lobe, which is later removed. If you look closely at the deep gray gray nuclei, the caudate, putamen, and globus pallidus, they're gray initially, but by the end they look practically white due to the retained gadolinium. And autopsy studies have also found retained gadolinium in the brain. Now there are different types of gadolinium contrast agents. Some are linear, where the gadolinium element is not fully surrounded by other atoms, and there are also macrocyclic agents where there's full enclosure of the potentially toxic gadolinium element, which some people believe are safer. And here are some examples of different contrast agents. You can see some macrocyclic agents on top, such as Prohans, and some linear agents in the next row, such as Magnavis. By the way, Magnavis uses the chelating agent DTPA, which has actually been proposed as a chelating agent to treat gadolinium toxicity by removing the heavy metal. So what predicts the risk of gadolinium accumulation in the organs. Well, getting repeated doses, getting a lot of different MRI scans with contrast, having impaired kidneys. We typically wouldn't give any gadolinium to someone who's on dialysis, but even an older person with marginal kidney function could be at increased risk. And linear agents such as these listed may be higher risk for retention in the organs. And in fact, the European Medicines Agency suggested limiting linear agents agents in 2017, and macrocyclic agents could be safer. Here's a study on rats where they actually sacrificed their rats and tested their gadolinium levels in different regions of the brain four weeks after exposure. You can see saline on the bottom right and the three different contrast agents. The two linear agents on top, there was much more retained gadolinium compared to doTERRAM gadoterate, which is is a macrocyclic agent on the bottom left, so perhaps it's safer, but I think this isn't definitive. Some other evidence suggests certain macrocyclic agents could actually be more toxic on a unit-by-unit -unit basis, even if less of it is retained in the organs. But even if gadolinium is retained within our organs, maybe it's harmless. Maybe it just hangs out benignly for years, but doesn't cause symptoms, much like the mercury in dental amalgams, perhaps. This is a study on rats who were given very high doses of multihance, a linear agent given to juvenile rats, and they tested them very carefully, and they seemed to have normal behavior and cognition, despite the fact that gadolinium did accumulate in their brains. But of course, they're rats. It's hard to know if they had subtle symptoms like pain or fatigue or subtle cognitive dysfunction that's difficult to measure. What about Parkinson's disease? We know gadolinium accumulates in the basal ganglia, the area of the brain injured in people with Parkinsonism. Parkinsonism is actually a class of diseases, only one of which is idiopathic Parkinson's disease. I'll spare you the technicalities. This is an observational study of 246,000 people who had MRI scans, 99,000 of which had gadolinium, the remainder of which had 
unenhanced scans, and they looked at the risk of Parkinsonism, and it was 1.17% in people who had gadolinium versus 1.16% in those without gadolinium, almost exactly the same within 0.01%. I think we can safely say gadolinium does not increase the risk of Parkinsonism. Here's data from the FAIRS database. This is kind of similar to VAERS, which is for vaccines, but this is for any drug. And any person can report to FAIRS if they have side effects from a medication. Now, of course, people probably aren't going to log on to the website if they don't have side effects. So take the percentages with a grain of salt, but perhaps this is useful in comparison comparing different agents. With the linear agent Multihans, 32.24% on this database reported adverse events compared to fewer 21%, 13%, and 13% with these three macrocyclic agents. So maybe linear agents are more harmful. And there's this idea of gadolinium deposition disease, this collection of symptoms or syndrome that could be due to retain gadolinium in the organs. Some examples of reported symptoms include pain in the bones or limbs, sometimes with a neuropathic character, burning or sharp pain, headaches that can be squeezing, brain fog, cognitive dysfunction, poor concentration, fasciculations, which are muscle twitches, and changes in the skin, such as discoloration. Of course, some of these symptoms are nonspecific, and it may be difficult to prove they're actually related to the contrast agent, and they could be misattributed to gadolinium, whereas they're actually due to something else in some cases, especially since someone having an MRI scan supposedly had it for a reason and may have had other symptoms prior to administration. It is possible to check levels of gadolinium. These are the normal ranges in whole blood, plasma, or urine. However, these are normal ranges in people who have not received gadolinium-based contrast agents. And remember, gadolinium, the element, is rare, so levels should be extremely low in people without exposure. So everyone who's received gadolinium-based contrast agents should have sky high levels, perhaps for years after administration, whether or not they have any specific symptoms. So I'm not sure these tests are useful. And I'll share in my personal experience, and I've been a doctor since 2009, and I'm a neurologist. I've ordered a lot of MRI scans, some with contrast, some without. I haven't recognized any particular repeatable syndrome that occurs after the contrast agents. It could be the risk is just low, so in an individual person, it's probably not going to happen. Of course, it's also possible that this is causing side effects and I'm just not recognizing it. And there may be some ways to mitigate risk of contrast agents. One thing is sometimes tests are overordered in medicine, and I think it's reasonable to avoid contrast unless it has some reasonable probability of actually being beneficial, of having significant diagnostic yield. For instance, let's say I expect the test is probably going to be negative anyway. I have a patient, let's say with headache, and I believe the diagnosis is migraine, but maybe there's something about their history, like they're over 50 years old with new onset headaches. I want to get an MRI scan just to be sure, but the description of their symptoms is very consistent with migraine. There are no red flags or abnormalities on exam. It would be reasonable to order the scan without contrast. For someone with a single generalized seizure, and I'm doing an MRI scan to rule out an underlying cause of epilepsy, we would usually do it without contrast. For multiple sclerosis, it's true that gas Gadolinium can help to show active lesions and can sometimes help with the diagnosis of MS, but in routine monitoring scans in people who are already on highly effective disease-modifying therapies, their risk of actually having enhancing lesions is very low. Some of these drugs are 99% effective at reducing enhancing lesions, so maybe the contrast dye isn't necessary, just my personal opinion. It may be safer to use macrocyclic agents. The data is preliminary, but there seems to be some evidence of this. And of course, we would avoid giving gadolinium to people with significant kidney dysfunction. 
There's actually some research on newer contrast agents which could be safer. For instance, manganese, another heavy metal, though it's also toxic at high doses. Also, there's some research on iron oxide nanoparticles, but these are not commercially available. It may be possible to treat excess gadolinium with chelation therapy. For instance, with the aforementioned agent DTPA, I'm not able to find any randomized trials showing it's beneficial, but there are some anecdotes of symptom relief. Of course, that's very preliminary. We just don't know at this time. And I'd be interested to know if you've had an MRI scan with gadolinium contrast dye. Did you have any side effects afterwards? What was the reason for the scan? How many scans have you had or administrations of gadolinium? And did you think it could have caused any harm to you? And let me know if you have any questions or suggestions for future videos in the notes below.